Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. Yeah, good morning, folks. It's so good to be here. And the story goes that this young man was sleeping in on a Sunday morning. And the uh, mother said, son, it's trying to get up, time to get up. And uh, he didn't respond. About five minutes later, son, you got to get up. It's church time. I don't want to get up. She waited another five minutes and said, that's it. She went into the room, son, you have to get up. But I don't want to. She says, you have to. You're the pastor. <laughs> now, here's my question. <laughs> Why is the pastor saying that? <laughs> Praise the Lord. I'm calling the message today entitled, The Called Out Ones. I'm basing it on Psalms 78, verses 70 through 72. He chose David, his servant, and took him from the sheep pens. From tending the sheep, he brought him to be the shepherd of his people, Jacob, of Israel, his inheritance. And David shepherded them with integrity of heart. With skillful hands, he led them. Now let's take a journey back a couple thousand years or so. And what was kind of like the other side of the life of God's people? Let me give you a few of them. They were lied against. They had a lot of physical needs, conspiracies against them, beatings, freezing, lack of food, stonings, lies always threatened, thrown in the fire, dropped into cisterns. That was a, like a deep pit that people would be thrown into. It was also for water. Thrown in prison, whipped and beaten, turned against, Persecuted, martyred, rejected, abandoned, jeered at, uh, complained about, deprived in, in so many ways. Oh, did I forget to tell you that this list was what happened to the shepherds, the judges, the priests, the called out ones. That was the other side of their life that they had to go through. I'm not talking about the regular people and that list. You read your Bible, you'll see all this happen to God's called out ones. Overseers, elders, pastors, teachers, evangelists. These are the ones that God put in charge of his work. And these are the things they had to go through. And this is what we would call our ministers today in that same type of category, but we, we call them ministers, pastors, shepherds. So let me add a few more things to that list of today. All right, shot, tortured. We had one of our missionaries, uh, Brother Tucker, was thrown to crocodiles and eaten, uh, thrown alive to crocodiles in Ghana, eaten alive. We had a missionary sitting in the chair. I've told this to the church before, but we had new people. He was put into a chair and told, you need to deny Christ and we'll save your life. And the missionary said, and this is in the archives of the Assemblies of God. And he says, I can't deny Christ. So they blew up the chair that he was sitting on. And when the dust settled, there he sat with a smile on his face. You have those that are being arrested for the stands that they're taken, imprisoned. And going through a lot of illnesses, being betrayed, the list just goes on, church. The other side of the story. But here's one, and you ready for the last one I want to share today? The last one, it's in this list, are those that are being disobeyed. You say, what does that got to do with any of those things? Why is that on the list? What, what, Why? Well, I hope to get all that out in the open today. That one of the greatest harms in the church today, harms, one of the worst things that can happen to a church today is to walk out of this place and walk in disobedience. 
with what's coming around the corner, with things as close as they are. Mm. This is not the day to be disobedient. This is the day to be obedient. And here's the question that we want to oppose. But what are we to be obeying? Who are we to be obeying? What does that look like? Now, these lists are the other side of ministry that many people, again, may not see and they may not hear about. Let me give you a modern-day update of a survey done by the uh, uh, West Wind Group Incorporated. And there are different surveys out there and different studies out there about the life of a pastor. They're out there. And some of them, the stats are a little different than others. It all depends on who's polled. all depends on how the polling goes. And what I'm going to read to you now today uh, is uh, a wide range of all churches and all pastors in America, not the Assemblies of God alone, all of them. At this point in time in life, 97% of pastors have been betrayed, falsely accused, and hurt by their trusted friends. 97%. 70% of pastors battle depression. 7,000 churches close each year. 1,500 pastors quit each month. Only 10% will retire as an actual pastor. 80% of pastors feel discouraged. 94% of pastors' family feel the pressure of ministry. 78% of pastors have no close friends. And 90% of working pastors spend 55 to 75 hours per week. That's just a little taste of how accurate that is, you know, the plus and minuses, and who did they survey, who, how many responded, all of that is, God has to be calculated into that. But it does tell you that there's another side to the life of a minister that others may not have a clue what it's like. So let's take a look at what God's word has to say about his called out ones. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 15, and it says, I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. Now, this is what God is saying to our team today. What he's saying is, is that I'm going to give to the congregation shepherds after my own heart who will feed you. Their job is to feed you with knowledge and understanding. That is a role this team has. That's a big role. That's a huge role. That's a very time-consuming role. Because they have to know the word so that they can deliver that word, explain that word, so that they can give you what God wants you to have. Because one day they will be held accountable for everything they say. Romans 13, 1 includes a couple thoughts here with our society and ministry. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. Now, that can be referring to the government authorities of our lands. Okay? For there is no authority except from God. So notice the phrase, there's no authority except from God. So the authority that we have in our land is from God. He instituted it. Whether they run it right, that's one thing. But God instituted it. Because he had it in the Old Testament, in the Bible days too, there was a government rule. But that can include those whom God places in authority over our lives as pastors, shepherds, leaders. And those that ex have exist have been instituted by God. So God not only instituted the governing of our land, but he instituted the governing of the church. And that's their role. And every single one of us ministers are under those that govern over us and our district. And there are those that are over them and our movement in Missouri, our headquarters, that governs the district. The district governs us. And we have the privilege of governing you. It is the divine structure of God. We need to know that. It's, just, it's not just about coming to church and going home. It's about coming to church and listening and doing something. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2 says, Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, 
respectable, hospitable, able to teach. That's a lot. Then there's Acts 5.29 that says we must obey God rather than men. Now that, that's a simple short phrase, but boy, it is a complex reality. Let me tell you something. There's a lot of things that men would like to have us do. But then there's that list that God has us to do. Because we have been called out to be those that God chooses to use. So now we have responsibility to obey God rather than men. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 2 and 3. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you are willing. As God wants you to be, not greedy for money, but eager to serve, not lorded it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. Ladies and gentlemen, if you just take those, those two verses and go home and reread that and think and look at that and list those things, that is a huge, huge responsibility. In fact, I am firmly, firmly believe only the called out ones, the ones that were called by God and not self-called, are the only ones that can really fulfill that. I believe they're the only ones that can do it because God empowers them to do it because he called them out as he called David out. Our role as shepherds is not to mold you into us. That's not our role. But into the image of Christ. And Paul said, follow that what you've seen me do. So you, we... He's encouraging people of God to follow your leaders who are in Christ. In other words, what does that mean? That means more responsibility and greater responsibility is upon the ministry team because they have to be as great as examples they can be so that you will want to follow the example you see in them in Christ. Don't use your calling, ministry team, to think that you have some kind of power or clout or entitlement over the people you serve. Don't do that. Don't do that. Or that you always want something from the people. You always want something because you are a minister. You know why I never put a clergy sticker on my car? Because I'm human. And I could be having a bad day. And I may not look like I'm a Christian. By honking the horn that way, I'm like, Aah! what's the matter with you? Uh, what's the matter with you? Uh? And then you drive by them, and they see, Pastor. Folks, I got stopped by a cop up here in Route 10 years ago. I was speeding. You're not going to believe why I was speeding. To catch up with somebody in the church to wave at them. <laughs> On my way to McDonald's, I wanted to say hi to somebody in the car that I knew. So uh, here comes a cop that way, and he goes over the medium, and I thought, I looked at my speed limit, and I said, I'm done. <laughs> I pulled off just before McDonald's, he walks up to the car, says, sir, I need your driver's license. Didn't have him. I said, sir, I do have it written on my checkbook in my briefcase. May I reach back and get it for you? Now I got it memorized, so I don't have to worry about it. And, and so he said, sure. So I reached back and was getting it out of my briefcase. And he says to me, he says, sir, what do you do? I said, do I have to tell you? <laughs> That's what I told him. He said, yes, you do. I says, well, I'm a minister at the church back there. He says, uh, I'm going to let you go, but be, be careful. Well, I said, thank you, sir. He got in the car, and I waved at him. He didn't wave back. <laughs> like I'm his big buddy now, you know? So, hey, buddy, how you doing? And so uh, I get back to the church, and I get out of the car, 
and I opened the back door to get my briefcase, and I have two books on the back seat facing, that when he looked in, he could see the covers because they're facing him. One of the books was the Bible. Now, that's good. You're not going to believe what book I was reading at the time. You're not going to believe it. The other book beside it said, Ministerial Ethics. <laughs> I was not very ethical that day. I was speeding, but I haven't been stopped since, and that was at least 20 years ago. What I'm saying is, nothing is old to us because we're pastors. What's old to us is what God gives us to do. And so, let God take care of you. Let God take care of your needs. Don't be out there trying to get something from somebody because you, you think you need that. Look, I'm, a lot of ministers do that. One, one minister got stopped by a Harrington cop. He was speeding. And when he went to the window, the, 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 he was a minister. He said, son, I'm a minister. I'm over you and the Lord. You need to let me go. I pray for you. I'm an authority over you. I'm a minister. He said, Okay. So the officer went back in his car and wrote up a, a ticket. He happened to be a born-again Christian. And I knew the cop because we talked at the front row of the seat over a situation in our church. And uh, he walked up to the window and he, he gave the, the, the minister a ticket, but he put the ticket inside of a track that said, how to be saved. <laughs> True story. Just because you're a minister, it does not give you privileges that don't belong to you. What belongs to you is what God gives you. Let God take care of your need. Amen? Amen. 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 Now, these five references are just some of the responsibilities listed in Scripture that apply to the team. And do you see their responsibilities here? Are you beginning to see what they've been called to do and to be? And one day, they're going to stand before God. And here's what God says to the church. Let's go back to Jeremiah 3.15 again. He said, I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will lead you with knowledge and understanding. So what that says, if we just took that one verse today, what it says is God has given you a gift. That gift is the called out ones to lead you. And you become a gift to them because they now can use you to help reach the lost in the community because their job is to prepare you to do the work of the Lord. Ephesians says that. So we are to listen to those whom God has called and has placed over us. Say listen. All right? You, we are called to listen to those whom God has placed over us. I want to tell you something that you can be very confident of. There is not one team member in this church who thinks they are better than you. Not one. Not one team member thinks they're better than you. At the same time, they are responsible to represent God's truth over you. And what I'm saying is, is that you may not want to hear what they're saying on a given service or a Bible study, or a Sunday school class, or the children's ministry, or the youth ministry, they care. You may not want to hear some of the things they're saying, but they're responsible before God to give you the truth. That's their job. That's their calling, is to lead you. Remember what we read in Psalms about David? It's the exact same thing for the team today. It hasn't changed in all these centuries. It's never changed, church. That's their job. Listen to what they're saying. And you all better be knowing what you're saying. And we all better be listening to what God is saying to the church today. He still lives. He still exists. He's still there. He's still on the throne. He's everywhere, church. Listen to what God has to say. 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 through 13. Now we ask you, brothers, to respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord. And who admonish you, hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work. 1 Timothy 5, 17 through 19, the elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor. Thank you for the blessings you're giving them today. That's like, that's like a double honor. 
And, and, and let me tell you something. I always found that what touched my heart wasn't just the blessings that people might give us, but the words they said. Right, team? The words that you wrote in the cards, were they melted your heart. They, you felt humble. I received a beautiful text this morning from a brother in the Lord in this church from the message. It humbled my heart. Folks, it, 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 you do something wonderful when you can express words to your team or say it to their face or send a text, send an email, leave a voicemail, something. It blesses their heart to hear what God's doing in your life. My wife will tell, and I, where is she? There she is. My wife and I will tell you to this day, what would be the greatest reward of 40 years of ministry in this church? And I promise you what my wife and I, the first answer out of our mouth was always this. A changed life. Right, babe? Amen. A changed life. There was nothing greater than a changed life. When we change, folks, we change the world. We change our city. We change our family. We change our schools. We change our colleges. When we change, they change. There's no greater reward in ministry than to see a changed life. Wow. I need to start preaching. Oh, I will be. I'm down at Somerville all month, next month, start in November. The elders who direct the affairs of the church are worthy of double honor, especially those who work is preaching and teaching. For Scripture says, do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain, and the worker deserves his wages. Do not entertain an accusation against an elder unless it is brought by two or three witnesses. Oh, my friends, it's interesting how you could spend years preaching, dedicating their children, marrying their children, uh, counseling them and, and teaching them and working with them and loving on them, visiting them at the hospitals and in their homes. And all of a sudden, somebody hears one thing against the pastor and they choose to believe that one thing after all those years of pouring into their lives. Unbelievable. You chose to believe one thing you heard without going straight to that person and checking it out. It's a sad day for your life and for the church. You see, it, it, it muzzles the church. It, it affects its growth. It affects its, out, it, it, it affects its productivity. It affects its vision because they're having to deal with all this junk that doesn't have to go on if you'd go to the right people and ask the right questions to get the right answers. And everyone said, all right. It's interesting. Go to them. Or make the person who comes to you about somebody, you make them go to that person. Don't you, don't you represent it? If you have an odd against one of these team members, get to them. Talk to them. They're not afraid of you, and you don't have to be afraid of them. I used to tell people in my office, I got broad shoulders. Lay it on me. Lay it on me. By the way, just in case you do hear something about me, <laughs> send them to me. See, I can say this strong stuff today because I, you remember sometimes I'd say some strong things. I'd say I got my car running. Well, I don't have my car running today because I don't work here anymore. <laughs> so I can say what I need to say. And I can just walk out and take my time to the car because I don't answer to you. I answer to God. Amen? Amen. So listen, if somebody has a problem against me, send it to me. Tell, me. tell them to do one thing. Make sure they bring the Bible. I want them to bring their, you got a problem against me, bring your Bible. Show me where I'm wrong. Honey, I will fix it. I will change and I will fix it. Because I want to do what God wants me to do. Not what you, but what God wants me to do. And by the way, there was a lady one time I told somebody that got back to me. She said, but listen, the Bible not bother to meet with the pastor. Because if you have to meet with the pastor, he'll tell you to bring your Bible. Really? Well, thank you for the advertisement. I appreciate that. I mean, that's, that's a campaign, campaign for me. Yeah, don't come meet me, me with a problem unless you read the Bible and show me in the Bible where it's been wrong. And let's exchange the scripture. Let's find out what is truth. And everyone said? Yes. Always remember, folks, two things. Always remember. Always remember this. God always knows the real truth behind the stories. And number two, God will, say will, yes. will always have the last word. And that's why I sleep good at night. That's why I sleep really good at night. Because I know who's in charge. Hebrews 13, 7. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. 
Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Hebrews 13, 17. Obey your leaders. Oh, here's that word, obey. Oh, no. He's just a man. She's just a woman. God, oh, come on. Well, it isn't what I said. Here we go again. It's what God said. Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. There's that divine structure again in Scripture. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy. You know, the joy of the Lord becomes our strength. And, and there are days that your pastors will stand in front of you and they'll be having a good old time ministering to you, but down deep in their heart, they're carrying a heavy load. They're carrying a burden. But the joy of the Lord becomes their strength. We can help their joy to be so strong and good if we would just obey, do what God has told them through them to you to do. All right? So that their work will be a joy and not a burden, for that would be of no advantage to you. You don't want to slow these people down. These people got vision. Are you kidding me? This, this, this team's got vision. This, our, our head pastor's got vision. These folks work together as a team. I come in here all the time. The week. They're laughing. They're talking. They're, they're having a good time. They love the Lord. They, they love you, the church. It, 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 they, they got it together. So may I add that, uh, well, here James 3 puts it all together. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. This bunch is going to be judged more strictly on Judgment Day than you. Not that you won't be judged, you know. So may I add that he or she who rejects such teaching will be judged more strictly than two, if we want to look at it that way. Amen. You see, the, the, folks, the, the team protects you. They are, I was a protector. My wife always called me the guardian. I was a protector, a guardian, a watcher. You have no clue what this team is protecting you from. You have no clue what the children's pastor, what the youth pastor, what the lead pastors and assistant pastors and all the team and all the team. You have no clue what they protect you from that you never know and you don't ever need to know, but they protect you. They protect you. And that's the way it was in my calling. We will have to give an account someday for what we said in this pulpit and in our classes. Disregard to submitting to authority is one of the biggest sins in the church today because it's going against God's divine structure and order. It was always God's intention to use his appointed and called out leaders in Scripture to rule over God's people and take them home safely. That was his structure. There's a well-known preacher right now who has been espousing in the pulpit that many of you probably know, huge church, that God did not create the universe. And here's what is also as troubling. It's a huge church, and if they are not leaving by the droves, why? How many of you people would stay in this church if I told you, by the way, we just found out God didn't really create the universe? When half the time you turn the page of the Bible in the Old Testament, there's something God created and did. It's just all through Scripture. And we're now saying he didn't create it. Hebrews talks about it. Now we're saying that he didn't create the universe? Why aren't those people leaving the church by the droves? See, the job of the pastor is to augment your study. They're not been called to put it all in you, and then you don't have to worry about it during the week. They'll tell you about it on Sunday. There's churches that do that. Not at this church. They're here to support what you're already learning at home because you're in the Word of God yourself. They're just here to help explain it, help you get through it, help you understand it better, and to lead and to, and to, to guide you. Um, we need to remember something very clearly today. You will not get that kind of teaching here at Calvary from anyone on this team, no matter what they have gone through to stand with and for the word of God. 
Because as a team, they are here to preach the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Their job is not to rearrange the scripture to hear what you itching ears want to hear because other churches are getting that kind of stuff. Their job is to preach and teach the word just as it is written. Does that make sense? So for that team, thank you. So we show our appreciation to you, team, for the following. This is appreciation from the congregation to you. Thank God you were called and appointed to this church. Thank God you pray and study your word. Thank God you are not afraid to deliver the truth to us, no matter that you're going to get flat when you do. Hopefully not, but if you do. Thank God you practice God's word in your daily walk. Thank God you're always available behind the scenes. And if you're not, start getting that way. Don't, don't let the phone take a message. You answer that phone. You have no clue how many dinners I couldn't make because I answered the phone. I answered the phone, and I was out at 1.30 in the morning. I was out at 3 o'clock in the morning. I'm traveling to different states while in the ministry here because I answered the phone, because I knew what was going on. Thank God you work hard. Thank God you go beyond the call of duty. You say, well, what's the difference between working hard and going beyond the call of duty? Well, simply, this team helps each other. If somebody has an extra load in one of these members, the other, the other team members kind of step in. Even the tech people, God bless that tech team we got in this church. They all step in, this big, it's just one big, giant team. And thank God that you choose to go through your battles instead of running from them. Like that minister who mom said, son, you have to get up. You're the pastor. So team, you got to come to work Monday morning, unless you're off that day. Because guess why? Because you're a shepherd. For that, we appreciate you. And we, the church, right now are going to stand up and give you a standing ovation. Let's do it, church. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. And Calvary Church, we want to show our appreciation as a team. I'm a dual purpose today. I don't know where to put myself. I'm a preacher and I'm also still a preacher. So I, I have to go back and forth here today. Uh, we show you our appreciation as a team. So here's what the team is saying to you today. Thank you for loving your team. Thank you for praying for your team. Thank you for helping your team. Thank you for blessing your team. Thank you for talking to your team. Thank you for listening to your team. Thank you for caring for your team. Thank you for submitting to your team. Thank you for remembering their families. Thank you for approaching them personally. They're not afraid of you, and you don't need to be afraid of me. It was fun when I tell Renee, Renee, tell us so I want to see them in my office. It was got to be kind of funny. And I got tickled inside when the first thing they would say is, am I in trouble? <laughs> and Renee said, they think you're in tr they're in trouble. I got some kind of pleasure out of that. I don't know why. I just did. I said, this is really cool. I'm to be feared. What's all? No, I'm, but it was so unnecessary. I'm the last. You know what I always say to Renee? Don't they know I'm the last person that they need to be afraid of? You need to be, we need to be afraid of what God can do, not what pastors can do. I'm the last person ever. If you ever need to come to me, come. Don't have to be afraid of me. I don't bite. So as the team approaches the platform this morning, behind me, we're going to special prayer. The board will join them. I want to just read the scripture verse again, and I'm going to give you just the simple takeaways that apply to this team today. He chose David, his servant, and took him from the sheep pens, from tending the sheep. He brought 
him to be the shepherd of his people Jacob, of Israel, his inheritance. And David shepherded them with integrity of heart, with skillful hands he led them. Now, I want to say this before, I want them in place before I read these. Uh, I am an assistant presbyter. I used to be a presbyter, but now I've been appointed by the district to be an assistant presbyter. And I have been given the title as care pastor for the district for over, to over 154 ministers. I'm in charge of all the uh, greater Philadelphia ministers and all the Delaware ministers. There's 50 Delaware ministers and there's 100 Philadelphia ministers. My role is to give them a call twice a year and to talk with them and pray with them. In fact, the other night I had one call me. He was returning a message and I talked with them and prayed with them. So at any given moment, I could get a phone call from 154 ministers to pray for them, uh, visit their church, help them with counseling, help them with church growth, whatever they need. Uh, we're supposed to be there to assist on behalf of the district. And I'm going to tell you something. I listen to a lot of things that are going on. I watch and I listen. And I'm going to say this from the depths of my heart, with the, every ounce of truth I can muster today, you have right here, right now, a great church. Trust me. You are a great church. You have a great board in this church. Boy, do you have a great board in this church. That's all I'm allowed to say. You have a great team in this church. This is one blessed church. And we need to thank God for that. So before I pray, I'm going to take that Psalms and put it into this. Your team was chosen. They were taken aside and they were brought to you to be a shepherd, to be a person of integrity, skillful. And by the way, the word skillful there, full of wisdom. With wisdom, God led them and is leading them. And friends, when you have that going on in the church, there's only one place this church can go, and that is forward. To reach our communities for the Lord Jesus Christ. And everyone said, amen. amen. Let's stand and let's pray for our ministry team today. Praise the Lord. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you so very, very much that you have worked in a way in our lives in this church to show that you are still on the throne. You've not left this church. And by the way, Lord, we believe there's a lot of other good churches and great churches in this town. We really do. We, there's no way Calvary has the attitude that we have a corner on you. No, we don't. You're doing great things around the world, in our country, in our state, and in our city. Thank you for all the churches that are preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ in this community and around us. And we are one of them, Lord. And we want to continue to be with those kind of churches. And Father, what it's going to take is a continual anointing and empowerment of our ministry team, of all of our church people, together as a team, we go forward. I pray that you bless their lives, strengthen their lives, meet their needs according to your riches in Christ Jesus. I pray that you heal them, body, soul, mind, and spirit, refurbish them, re-strengthen them, re-envision through them. And Father, we just pray, God, that you will close the mouths of the lines that are out there to do damage. Close the mouths of the lines. And raise up, Lord, your voice of truth. And we just ask, God, that you continue to minister by the power of your spirit. Thank you for what you've done and what you're going to do. And we commit the rest of this day into your hands. And all, and by the way, Lord, we pray for our congregation to meet them, body, soul, and spirit as well. And we all prayed this in Jesus' name. And everyone prayed, amen. amen.